In this video, I'll give a brief overview of my paper, Two Varieties of Cognitive Penetration. To begin, I'll talk about what cognitive penetration is. In part one, I'll distinguish two different types of cognitive penetration. And in part two, I'll suggest that empirical evidence provides support for one of these two types of cognitive penetration. I'll conclude with a few open questions I still have concerning the cognitive penetration debate. One way of asking whether there is cognitive penetration is by asking whether beliefs, desires, intentions, or other aspects of our cognitive lives influence how we perceptually experience the world. Unfortunately, this way of framing the question leads to a somewhat trivial answer. Yes, I can, for instance, intentionally close my eyes. For this reason, the movement of one's eyes, head, or body, along with any changes in proximal stimulus, usually are excluded from the cognitive penetration debate. Sometimes, attention is also excluded as a case of cognitive penetration. Recently, this exclusion has been criticized, however. The exclusion of attention from the debate likely rests on outdated assumptions, such as the assumption that attention is, or is closely analogous to, a spotlight mechanism that selects locations in one's field of view, or that attention only operates pre or post perceptually. In the paper, I discuss in more detail the problems with these two assumptions, but for now I'll say that an exclusion of attention at the outset of discussion seems unmotivated and is potentially question begging. I agree that we ought to leave the door open to cases of cognitive penetration by attention. On that note, my tone towards cognitive penetration by attention will be a bit more skeptical, and I'll suggest that cognitive penetration by attention amounts to one of two types of cognitive penetration. This leads us to part one, two types of cognitive penetration. Definitions of cognitive penetration tend to be controversial, and I take it that a more promising starting point is to focus on the theory-neutral consequences of cognitive penetration, as suggested recently by Dustin Stokes. Stokes uses this approach to develop a definition of cognitive penetration, but our aim can be a bit more modest. We can use these consequences as a sufficient condition for cognitive penetration and as a means of distinguishing different types of cognitive penetration. What are these consequences? I take it that there are roughly two kinds. First, there are epistemic consequences. If cognitive penetration occurs, then observation's role in resolving theoretical or everyday disputes can be threatened. However, these epistemic consequences don't have to be negative. For instance, perceptual learning and perceptual expertise may amount to cases of epistemically beneficial cognitive penetration. We can make a finer distinction among two types of epistemic consequences. On one hand, there are what I call downstream epistemic consequences. In these cases, experience is biased due to a cognitive influence, but the epistemic status of the experience need not be altered. A case resulting in downstream epistemic consequences, which wouldn't be a case of cognitive penetration per se, but is nonetheless helpful to consider, is selective looking. Suppose I'm in a room with green and yellow objects, and I selectively look at only the green objects. In this case, my experience would be biased, towards the green objects due to a cognitive influence, but the epistemic status of the experience itself need not be altered. On the other hand, there are what I call experiential epistemic consequences. In these cases, the epistemic status of experience is altered by a change in the content of experience due to cognitive influence. A case resulting in experiential epistemic consequences is Siegel's 2012 angry face case. In this example, my antecedent and unjustified belief that you are angry at me influences my perceptual experience so that I experience your face as angry, whereas otherwise, had I not had the antecedent belief, I wouldn't have experienced your face as angry. This is an example of an experiential epistemic consequence. Epistemic consequences aren't the only consequences of cognitive penetration. Cognitive penetration also may result in informational encapsulation consequences. If we remember back to modularity of mind by Fodor, we'll remember that an essential characteristic of a Fodorian module is informational encapsulation. Informational encapsulation depends on the limits of information flow into a system or a module. 
What's relevant for our purposes is that cognitive penetration is inversely related to the informational encapsulation of perceptual systems from cognitive systems. That is, if cognitive penetration occurs, then perceptual systems are less informationally encapsulated from cognitive systems. However, we can also make a finer distinction among two types of informational encapsulation consequences. On one hand, there are what I call causal informational encapsulation consequences. In these cases, certain cognitive processes are able to cause certain perceptual processes. An example resulting in causal informational encapsulation consequences is given by Fiona McPherson. Suppose I have a belief concerning my upcoming exam, which results in migraines that, in turn, result in visual flashes. This would be a case in which a certain cognitive process causes a certain perceptual process. On the other hand, there are what I call semantic informational encapsulation consequences. And in these cases, perceptual systems can draw on semantic content from cognitive systems. A case which would result in semantic informational encapsulation consequences is given by what I call a methodologically idealized version of Levin and Benaji's 2006 experiments concerning race categorization and face brightness judgments. In these cases, two faces which are matched for mean luminance and mean contrast nonetheless produce different apparent brightness judgments in subjects. Assuming that the results of these experiments are accepted, which I believe there's reason to be skeptical about, the result would be that perceptual systems are able to draw on content from cognitive systems, namely content concerning race category. So these cases would result in semantic informational encapsulation consequences. One of the benefits of noting these different consequences of cognitive penetration is that we are now in a position to state a sufficient condition for cognitive penetration. Barring movement or changes in proximal stimulus, if epistemic and informational encapsulation consequences occur, then cognitive penetration occurs. In addition, and perhaps more interestingly, we're also in a position to distinguish two types of cognitive penetration on the basis of distinct epistemic and informational encapsulation consequences. I call these two types of cognitive penetration cognitive shifting and cognitive amplification. Cognitive shifting involves experiential epistemic consequences and semantic informational encapsulation consequences. Cognitive amplification involves downstream epistemic consequences and causal informational encapsulation consequences. Cognitive shifting is a more controversial form of cognitive penetration. In the second part of this talk, I'll discuss empirical evidence in favor of cognitive amplification. To make the case for actual instances of cognitive amplification, I'll first establish this claim, attentional modulation, that non-spatial forms of cognitively directed attention affect perceptual experience by affecting perceptual processing itself. Second, I'll claim that attentional modulation is an instance of cognitive amplification. Due to issues of length, I'll mainly focus on establishing attentional modulation. However, in the paper, I argue that attentional modulation is an instance of cognitive amplification. I'll start with an experiment by Gary Lupian and Michael Spivy showing that category-based attentional cues facilitate visual detection. We can ignore the top array, which was used in an additional experimental condition involving a difference in symbol font. In this experiment, subjects are told to fixate on a cross at the center of the screen and click as soon as they detect a visual probe. After either a label or no label auditory cue, a stimulus array appears. On some trials, a probe appears next to one of the stimuli, whereas on other trials, no probe appears. During these latter catch trials, subjects are instructed not to click. There is no evidence suggesting that these auditory cues result in a speed accuracy trade-off. The central result of this experiment is that labeled auditory cues decrease reaction times for the detection of probes located near stimuli of the same semantic category as the cue. For instance, if the auditory cue, a 10 to 5, is played prior to the display 
of an array of two and five symbols, a subject will detect a probe located next to a five symbol significantly more quickly than she would have had she heard the unlabeled auditory cue, attend a category. These cues are informationally redundant, since each block of trials is, in addition, cued beforehand, and target category remain constant for hundreds of trials. So what do I take these experiments to show? First, I take it that non-spatial attention is involved in this experiment. Since the labeled cues provide no information concerning the spatial location of the probe, attention in these experiments is not an instance of selection or enhancement by location. In addition, semantic priming alone can't explain these results, since labeled cues are informationally redundant, as I noted a minute ago, and the cueing benefits are transient, appearing only for stimulus to probe delays between 1.25 and 1.5 seconds. I also take it that attention in these experiments is cognitively driven. The labeled auditory cues, such as attend to five and attend to two, direct attention on the basis of lexical representations. And these cues would provide no attentional benefit without some possession of the corresponding concepts, five and two, respectively. Due to the nature of these cues, I also take it that a perceptual priming explanation is not plausible. For instance, the labeled auditory cue, a 10 to 5, doesn't involve the presentation of a particular image of a 5. So, it looks like we're halfway to this claim, attentional modulation, that non-spatial forms of cognitively directed attention affect perceptual experience by affecting perceptual processing itself. However, I haven't shown that the effect is either perceptual or that it's reflected in perceptual experience. To do that, I'd like to turn to another experiment. In this experiment by Gary Lupian and Emily Ward, informative auditory cues presented prior to stimulus onset help to bring otherwise invisible masked stimuli into awareness. Using a self-report measure, Lupian and Ward demonstrate that valid auditory cues such as the auditory cue pumpkin, where the mask stimulus is a pumpkin, result in increased detection sensitivity to mask stimuli relative to both invalid cue conditions and no cue conditions. In fact, invalid cue conditions show decreased likelihood of stimulus detection relative to no cue conditions. In short, the likelihood of mask stimulus detection varied depending on the validity of the auditory cue. The cueing effect in Lupian and Ward's experiment seems to be perceptual. Stimuli mask using continuous flash suppression, the masking technique used in this experiment, receive little or no semantic processing. What's important is that if a post-perceptual judgment or memory account were correct, then only semantically processed stimuli should receive a cueing benefit. However, the results indicate the opposite of such a post-perceptual prediction. Valid auditory cues both increase sensitivity to and decrease reaction times for semantically unprocessed mask stimuli. Since a post-perceptual account is the main competitor to this perceptual account, I take it that the effect is perceptual. Finally, I suggest that these changes in perceptual processing are reflected in perceptual experience. Subjects reports provide prima facie evidence that the perceptual experience of a mask stimulus changes across valid, invalid, and no cue conditions. However, there is an objection in the ballpark. I call this the overflow objection. This objection claims that phenomenal consciousness of a mass stimulus is static across valid, invalid, and no cue conditions. However, subjects are more likely to access the mask stimulus invalid cue conditions. I think there's reason to reject this overflow objection. First, note that masking by continuous flash suppression results in diminished visual afterimages, where the presence of such afterimages is commonly taken to reflect low-level perceptual processing. In fact, Lupin and Ward demonstrate that their continuous flash suppression technique results in such visual afterimage reduction. In addition, 
fMRI evidence indicates that masking by continuous flash suppression results in significantly degraded stimuli responses in V1, V2, and V3. The upshot is that due to these low-level processing disruptions, it is plausible that subjects are not phenomenally conscious of more than they report. Now, assuming that subjects' positive reports are not mere blindsight-like guesses, then they are more frequently phenomenally conscious of mask stimuli in valid queuing conditions than in invalid or no queuing conditions. Thus, phenomenal consciousness of a mask stimulus does not remain static across these queuing conditions and is instead modulated by category-based attention. I'll briefly note that this reply to the overflow objection does not beg the question against the proponent of phenomenal overflow. This is because it's compatible with phenomenal overflow. This response merely suggests that due to low-level processing disruptions, phenomenal overflow is unlikely in cases of continuous flash suppression. I provided a few reasons in support of this claim, attentional modulation, that non-spatial forms of cognitively directed attention affect perceptual experience by affecting perceptual processing itself. Again, in this video, I haven't argued that attentional modulation is an instance of cognitive amplification, but I still hope this claim appears plausible, and I spend more time discussing this point in the paper. To say that attentional modulation is an instance of cognitive amplification is to say that it results in downstream epistemic consequences and causal informational encapsulation consequences. Let me briefly conclude. If I am correct that there are actual instances of cognitive amplification, then the discussion of cognitive penetration should focus on whether there are actual instances of cognitive shifting, the more controversial type of cognitive penetration. Now, Given what I've said, there may be further types of cognitive penetration, also distinguished on the basis of distinct consequences. In light of this, I think some sources worth considering are mental imagery, ambiguous images, and Carrasco-style changes in phenomenology due to attention. I discuss a few of these cases in greater length in the paper. Thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to our discussion.